Hey guys, welcome back. This is a video that I am pretty excited for because it's stuff that I like to do. So basically, going into this year, one of dad's biggest goals and mine is to make Retro Nova faster because we know it's got it in it or we think we have it in it. There's no reason it shouldn't have it in it to be faster. It's just that we haven't seen it yet. So dad emailed one of his global files and data logs over to Brian Macy, who is incredibly smart with EFI and tuning and all that. So dad sent that over to him a couple weeks ago. He looked at it. He also sent all of his specs over. So Brian looked at the combination as a whole, as well as the tune and kind of got an idea of what he thinks upgrades or changes need to be made. So one of the best things is that the combination physically is a good combination, which is just nice to have reassurance, but there's nothing necessarily actually holding it back physically. So that is great. We're not having to make huge changes there. We'll probably upgrade injectors as we get closer to turning it up. So going into the season, getting new injectors, and then there'll be some other small stuff here and there. But the main things that he's doing is just going through the tune and fixing bits and pieces all along the way that overall is going to make a difference on the track. So really excited to see that. Uh, hopefully bump the car up to where we need to see it. Um, Dad and I were talking last night. He was explaining to me what Brian had told him and we were talking about some different gather data gathering points we need to have next year and some different pieces and sensors we need to have to make some of the changes like Brian was suggesting. So uh, one of them was a drive shaft speed sensor. So I know you're probably thinking, why does that car not already have that on there? Which, good question, but it's better late than never, right? Yeah? So dad and I were talking about it last night. We were looking him up, gonna order one, but it's not what he does. It's not, <laughs> apparently it's not what I do. So we were making it instead. So dad got here earlier today, got started on it, and then I'm gonna come in do a program to cut the teeth. Um, and do a little bit of like chamfer work on it. So nothing too complicated, simple, but that way I can kind of show a little bit of that like I was talking about in the last video. And then finally, friend Ryan Whitty from Holly, who has the High Performance Consulting YouTube channel, another EFI guru, uh, lots of background and experience there. He is going to be coming on explaining the different type of Hall Effect sensors and what actually a Hall Effect sensor means. Stay tuned. Let's get to machining. Okay, so I've got started drawing the program. I just want to reiterate, I talked about it in my last video that I am self-taught with like CAD, CAM, it's all self-taught. So I don't have any formal experience really. Um, so it may not be the proper way, but it is how I do it and how it gets done. So uh, don't critique too hard, <laughs> please. But um, dad's got his part already in the middle. That he's working on so part of it he did by hand like I said he started on it this morning and then part is what I'm gonna do on here so I'm just gonna flip around show what I've done and then I'm gonna go back to drawing and then show you a little bit more so the computer is pretty slow and laggy right now so it's a little glitchy as I'm showing you but anyways so I started out with the uh, inner diameter for where it'll go mount on the yoke so this is a 2.125 diameter, and then I took the outer diameter, which is 3.75. We're doing a 32 tooth, so there is 32 um, teeth, which are going to be these flat spots, and then there's also 32, like, a uh, dip. What I did was I took, and I made the 0.187 because that's the size of the bit we wanted to use, so I took and did a circle with a 187 diameter and put the, the edge right on the edge of this circle. That would have been a full circle. Made tangent lines up, and then I rotated it with a circular pattern 64 times, skipped every other one, and then there is going to be here and here that's how it'll bolt together so i'll have to show you that as i go now i'm going to do is extrude it i want to show this part because it's always when it starts to look real so do this inner part so we're going to extrude that 0.97 then i'll turn my sketches back on so we can see extrude again we're going to do it as a joining body do the teeth part so we're going to do those 0.375 so now that's joined to that and then turn the sketches off so you can see it. So that's what, let's see, let's flip it. It's basically what it'll look like there. So this is the part that's gonna go on the yoke, yolk, and then uh, this is the part that is going to count off of the sensor. Okay, so dad got started on this this morning. Heavy round stock, so it's two pieces of one inch plate that just scraps. And I 
machined them, faced them, and tack welded them together. So it's actually split right there. You can't hardly see it. But it's tack welded together, and I've machined the hole to fit the yoke on the rear end and then cut the, the beginning and the outside diameter. So what we're going to do now is drill down and bolt the two halves together. Then I can cut the welds and put it horizontally and finish cutting the diameter of it. Now doing some reference for him. He's going to do doing this next part in the machine manually, but I'll show you what I'm doing. So right here, uh, as I mentioned, this is where the yoke is going to go. Um, so it needs to be two pieces so that way we can get it on there. The way it's going to clamp is taking two Allen bolts and he's going to be drilling holes vertically. So clamp down. Um, so what I'm doing now, just, just once, like I said for reference, is so I can get him some numbers, is splitting this body so that way he can see. So I've drawn a new sketch plane on top here and then I have just drawn a straight line across for a splitting tool. So now I'm going to split the body click the body I want to split, do my splitting tool right here, okay. So then now it is two separate components, and just so you can see, kind of cool, can move it away, now it's two pieces. So I'll just be using this to give him some reference to do it manually in the machine, and then we'll go back to the program that we're going to do with this. Okay, so now what I did is um, just, I didn't record it, it was basically just mirroring this set of holes over here. So I just used, uh, went in and edited the sketches. I should have done it when I originally drew on each side, but I, haven't, I don't do this super regularly. So it's one of those things, it's just process and I did it out of order. But anyway, so I just went in, edited the sketches, mirrored it over a line in the center, and then just added it to the cut. So that was the part there. Um, but anyway, so now it's got the holes on both sides, countersunk for the Allen bolt and all that. The cool part about this one is it doesn't get into the teeth themselves. Um, and then up here, I also added a step down. So just drew another circle, 2.192. So uh, just took that because that's his yoke has a step in it. So that's just how it'll be in real life. And then we're going to add chamfers now and then maybe add some lightning points. Okay, so now I've got it all the way drawn, and I'll go back and show the final product, product here. But um, as I was talking a little bit earlier, was saying I was doing this so Dad could get some reference numbers so he could draw. So what I've done is just gone back in, and he needed to know the distance from the front of the gear to the center of the holes. So I just went in, drew a reference line, um, got the distance there, and then I just now did a measurement. The other measurement he needed was from the center of this hole to the center of that hole. So that's what he needed for uh, his work so that way he can do it in the machine. And then here is the final part. So I need to finish that sketch. So turn the sketch off. So went in. We're not going to do any lightning on it because it's that way we can get it done quick. Uh, also it's light anyways small piece but just added a chamfer here chamfer on the inside and then a chamfer right here so that is the final piece now he's going to do his part of the machining and then I'll do a quick program to cut the teeth out what are you doing here I'm gonna draw all that I'm kind of cheating because it's we're only gonna make this one if we were doing multiples we actually make this in a program but you can't hardly see the split line but I've got the bit set where that's actually a split so we're going to drill down a quarter inch on each side off of your measurements and then I'm going to drill down three eighths of an inch minus one quarter so it'll be a half inch and then we'll drill all the way through with a 0.201 for quarter inch thread.
Okay, so that is the machining processes all done that you saw in the last uh, clip time lapse. So super simple processes. Just uh, contour here, chamfer here. It looks weird and not correct because obviously this part hasn't been cut in this model here, um, but it's already cut in real life. So that's why that looks like that. I was messing around with the chamfer a little bit because like I said, I don't do it every day and I couldn't decide if I wanted to do it as an actual chamfer or as a contour. Um, they use different geometry, but with an actual chamfer, you can go in and do a bit offset right here so that way you're not cutting right on the tip of the bit so that's why I wanted to do it like that so I had to mess around with the geometry uh, for just a second there okay so I just finished drawing and doing machining processes uh, got that ready so what are you doing this is the piece or the beginning of the piece so we drilled our holes that's actually bolted together if you can see the bolt down in there it's step three times one for threads one for the bolt and then one for the head of the bolt so it's, like I said, it's just made out of scrap. I literally picked up two pieces of crap, put them together. So what we're gonna do is make a, a piece that'll sit down in here precision and I'll bolt it to the mill table like this with a half inch bolt through it. And then we'll finish machining the round. So this is just a just one time a fixture. use fixture. This is the piece that he made just a second ago that he's using. So chopped off those edges on the bandsaw, got it as close to the 3.75 diameter that you could bandsaw wise. Now he's getting ready to finish that off. That's something we could have, I, I mean, technically drawn over here, but already in the middle of this. So he's gonna finish that by hand, old school. Old school is cool. <laughs> just took it out of the machine and off the lathe so, so it's gonna be a little different than the drawing because mid machining decided he wanted to change decided the teeth could be just a little bit narrower and that gives me this space away from the pinion support so the sensor can come down and be in the middle of it without hitting the pinion support just puts a little space in here so, so the teeth are a little bit narrower i just moved it around a little bit put this taper on here so than that. getting ready to do the send programs from here now to there. So it is on the second pass of cutting the teeth. So it'll go down one more time and do that again. Okay, so here it is all finished. Turned out pretty nice. 32 tooth and then there's the two bolts that clamp it together. There's a little chatter there, it looks like, but other than that, super smooth. Okay, so Dad is actually getting ready to put it on the yoke, so you show how good it actually fits. Um, and then that part will be done, and then we just got to add a Hall Effect sensor. So, two pieces, show it apart. Nice. Stepped. Most of them just go around a small part of the yoke. I decided I didn't want to get my bolts into the wider sensor teeth that we made than some. Some are very narrow. So we made the whole thing a little bit wider and then I went ahead and stepped it so these two measurements are really tight tolerance. I put it on once and took it off a minute ago. I actually had to hit it a little bit to get it to release. It was such a tight tolerance. So top piece is gonna go up over see the step and the yoke. And you can see how the Step in the reluctor wheel, if you want to call it that. About a three thousandths interference fit, so once it's tightened down, it's gonna stay put. Then we'll bring a sensor up at the top, but it'll be off one of these bolts. I'll make a bracket and that sensor will just point right there. 
with whatever air gap it's supposed to have and we'll take that right into the holly. Simple, simple. Yep, nice, works good. Now for the next part, which you've actually been waiting this whole time for, I know it. Ryan Whitty, you're up. Hi, I'm Ryan. I run the High Performance Consulting YouTube channel. I do videos on how to tune and set up your EFI, as well as cover some of the more fun stuff like how sensors work and things like that. Head over and check out my channel. Give it a like and a subscribe if you like what you see here. When you're choosing a drive shaft speed sensor, there's a few things you got to watch for as you're picking components and parts. Uh, if you don't buy a matched kit from someone, you have to watch out that you're getting the right wheel as well as the right sensor to go with that wheel. One of the first things to do is check and see if you are getting a toothed wheel or a flying magnet wheel. Uh, the, the flying magnet wheel is more or less what it sounds like. There are magnets pressed into the wheel that goes on the drive shaft yoke and they fly around as the drive shaft yoke turns. Uh, a toothed wheel is exactly what it sounds like. There are teeth just machined into the wheel, not magnets, just it's made of a ferrous material that a sensor can read. Once you know what sort of wheel you're working with, the next thing is to start looking at the sensor to go with it. There's a couple things to consider there. Uh, the biggest ones are one, is it meant to target a magnet or is it meant to target the ferrous steel teeth? The next is to pick either a VR or a Hall sensor that matches up to it. So VR stands for variable reluctance. It's a real, all it means is as the trigger, the ring passes by it, it picks it up and creates its own electricity basically. So the VR sensor as the wheel spins will start creating a voltage that looks something like this, just a sinusoidal wave. And the faster you go, the bigger that wave gets. So it creates more voltage as you go faster. That's important to note that it crosses zero. So this is your zero volt line and it should be equal above and below. Why that matters is at low speeds, you know, just barely moving, it will be harder for the ECU to pick up that sensor. As you go faster, it gets easier and easier. VR sensors can also be very sensitive to air gap uh, as you run the sensor closer and closer to the, the drive shaft wheel, you'll find that the voltage goes up at lower and lower speeds. So you can, if you're having issues reading at a low speed, you can try screwing the sensor in and getting it closer to the trigger wheel to make it read sooner. The other type of sensor is a Hall effect sensor. A Hall sensor is commonly referred to as a digital sensor, digital meaning on or off, and that's how the ECU reads it. The output of the sensor is a square wave, meaning it just is either off or it goes straight up, it reads a voltage and is on, and then it returns back to the off state. So this lower voltage here is zero volts. And then up here can be any voltage really. Typically there'll be five volt or 12 volt in the automotive applications we're talking about. Uh, it can be battery voltage or any other voltage. The key takeaway here is that the ECU is just looking for a voltage over a certain amount, meaning anything over say three and a half volts will count as triggered. Uh, the benefit of this is any sort of noise you might have in the system down here gets filtered out. So they're a lot less susceptible to random noise than a VR sensor may be. And that's the basics of a dry shaft speed sensor or any, or any speed sensor for that matter. This all applies to your engines, crank sensor and cam sensor as well or any sensor that's rotating for that matter. Okay, and that is a wrap. And I would say it was successful because the ring fits. I mean, I say it's successful. We'll see if it's successful once we're actually using it and we can actually prove it. But so far the machining part was successful. So um, anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you also to Ryan for making a great video that was super informative. I learned something from it as well. Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you did, go make sure to check out his channel. Like and subscribe there. He has all kinds of EFI tips that, if you're interested in that, will be very helpful. So that is it for now. Thank you again for watching. And as always, be happy, go fast, and stay pretty. I will see you guys next time.